Section 19 of Whirly Gigs by O. Henry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Tommy's Burglar. At ten o'clock p.m., Felicia the maid, left by the basement door with the policeman to get a raspberry phosphate around the corner. She detested the policeman and objected earnestly to the arrangement. She pointed out, not unreasonably, that she might have been allowed to fall asleep over one of St. George Rathborne's novels on the third floor, but she was overruled. Raspberries and cops were not created for nothing. The burglar got into the house without much difficulty, because we must have action and not too much description in a two-thousand-word story. In the dining room, he opened the slide of his dark lantern. With a brace and center bit, he began to bore into the lock of the silver closet. Suddenly, a click was heard. The room was flooded with electric light. The dark velvet portieres parted to admit a fair-haired boy of eight in pink pajamas, bearing a bottle of olive oil in his hand. "'Are you a burglar?' he asked, in a sweet, childish voice. "'Listen to that!' exclaimed the man, in a hoarse voice. "'Am I a burglar? What do you suppose I have a three days' growth of bristly beard on my face for, and a cap with flaps? Give me the oil, quick, and let me grease the bit, so I won't wake up your mamma, who is lying down with a headache, and left you in charge of Felicia, who has been faithless to her trust. Oh, dear, said Tommy with a sigh, I thought you would be more up to date. This oil is for the salad when I bring lunch from the pantry for you, and Mama and Papa have gone to the Metropolitan to hear de Retsky. But that isn't my fault. It only shows how long the story has been knocking around among the editors. If the author had been wise, he'd have changed it to Caruso in the proofs. Be quiet, hissed the burglar under his breath. If you raise an alarm, I'll wring your neck like a rabbit's. Like a chicken's, corrected Tommy. You had that wrong. You don't wring rabbit's necks. Aren't you afraid of me, asked the burglar. You know I'm not, answered Tommy. Don't you suppose I know fact from fiction? If this wasn't a story, I'd yell like an Indian when I saw you, and you'd probably tumble downstairs and get pinched on the sidewalk. I see, said the burglar, that you're on to your job. Go on with the performance. Tommy seated himself in an armchair and drew his toes up under him. Why do you go around robbing strangers, Mr. Burglar? Have you no friends? I see what you're driving at, said the burglar with a dark frown. It's the same old story. Your innocence and childish insouciance is going to lead me back into an honest life. Every time I crack a crib where there's a kid around, it happens. Would you mind gazing with wolfish eyes at the plate of cold beef that the butler has left on the dining table, said Tommy. I'm afraid it's growing late. The burglar accommodated. Poor man, said Tommy, you must be hungry. If you will please stand in a listless attitude, I will get you something to eat. The boy brought a roast chicken, a jar of marmalade, and a bottle of wine from the pantry. The burglar seized a knife and fork sullenly. It's only been an hour, he grumbled, since I had a lobster with a pint of musty ale up on Broadway. I wish these story writers would let a fellow have a pepsin tablet anyhow between feeds. My papa writes books, remarked Tommy. The burglar jumped to his feet quickly. You said he had gone to the opera, he hissed hoarsely, and with immediate suspicion. I ought to have explained, said Tommy. He didn't buy the tickets. The burglar sat again and toyed with a wishbone. Why do you burgle houses? asked the boy wonderingly. Because, replied the burglar, with a sudden flow of tears. God bless my little brown-haired boy Bessie at home. Ah, said Tommy, wrinkling his nose, you got that answer in the wrong place. You want to tell me your hard luck story before you pull out the child stop? Oh, yes, said the burglar, I forgot. Well, once I lived in Milwaukee, and... Take the silver, said Tommy, rising from his chair. Hold on, said the burglar. But I moved away. I could find no other employment. For a while I managed to support my wife and child by passing Confederate money. But alas, I was forced to give up that because it did not belong to the Union. I became desperate and a burglar. Have you ever fallen into the hands of the police? asked Tommy. 
"'I said burglar, not beggar,' answered the cracksman. "'After you finish your lunch,' said Tommy, "'and experience the usual change of heart, "'how shall we wind up the story?' "'Suppose,' said the burglar thoughtfully, "'that Tony Pastor turns out earlier than usual tonight, "'and your father gets in from Parsifal at ten-thirty. "'I am thoroughly repentant "'because you have made me think of my own little boy, Bessie, and—' "'Say,' said Tommy, "'haven't you got that wrong?' "'Not on your colored crayon drawings by B. Corey Kilvitt,' said the burglar. "'It's always a Bessie that I have at home, artlessly prattling to the pale-cheeked burglar's bride. "'As I was saying, your father opens the front door, just as I am departing, with admonitions and sandwiches that you have wrapped up for me. "'Upon recognizing me as an old Harvard classmate, he starts back in—' Not in surprise, interrupted Tommy, with wide open eyes. He starts back in the doorway, continued the burglar, and then he rose to his feet and began to shout, Ra, 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 ra. Well, said Tommy wonderingly, that's the first time I ever knew a burglar to give a college yell when he was burglarizing a house, even in a story. That's one on you, said the burglar with a laugh. I was practicing the dramatization. If this is put on the stage, that college touch is about the only thing that will make it go. Tommy looked his admiration. You're on all right, he said. And there's another mistake you've made, said the burglar. You should have gone some time ago and brought me the nine dollar gold piece your mother gave you on your birthday to take to Bessie. But she didn't give it to me to take to Bessie, said Tommy, pouting. Come, come, said the burglar sternly. It's not nice of you to take advantage because the story contains an ambiguous sentence. You know what I mean. It's mighty little I get out of these fictional jobs, anyhow. I lose all the loot, and I have to reform every time. And all the swag I'm allowed is to blame little old foldy raws and luck pieces that you kids hand over. Why, in one story, all I got was a kiss from a little girl who came in on me when I was opening a safe and it tasted of molasses candy, too. I've a good notion to tie this table cover over your head and keep on into the silver closet. Oh, no, you haven't, said Tommy, wrapping his arms around his knees, because if you did, no editor would buy the story. You know you've got to preserve the unities. So have you, said the burglar, rather glumly. Instead of sitting here talking impudence and taking the bread out of a poor man's mouth, what you'd like to be doing is hiding under the bed and screeching at the top of your voice. You're right, old man, said Tommy heartily. I wonder what they make us do it for. I think the SPCC ought to interfere. I'm sure it's neither agreeable nor usual for a kid of my age to butt in when a full-grown burglar is at work and offer him a red sled and a pair of skates not to awaken his sick mother. And look how they make the burglar act. You think editors would know, but what's the use? The burglar wiped his hands on the tablecloth and arose with a yawn. Well, let's get through with it, he said. God bless you, my little boy. You have saved a man from committing a crime this night. Bessie shall pray for you as soon as I get home and give her her orders. I shall never burglarize another house, at least not until the June magazines are out. It'll be your little sister's turn, then, to run in on me while I am abstracting the U.S. 4% from the tea urn and buy me off with her coral necklace and a falsetto kiss. You haven't got all the kicks coming to you, sighed Tommy, crawling out of his chair. Think of the sleep I'm losing, but it's tough on both of us, old man. I wish you could get out of the story and really rob somebody. Maybe you'll have the chance if they dramatize us. Never, said the burglar gloomily between the box office and my better impulses that your leading juveniles are supposed to awaken and the magazines that pay on publication. I guess I'll always be broke. I'm sorry, said Tommy sympathetically, but I can't help myself any more than you can. It's one of the canons of household fiction that no burglar shall be successful. The burglar must be foiled by a kid like me or by a young lady heroine, or at the last moment, by his old pal, Red Mike, who recognizes the house as one in which he used to be the coachman. 
you have got the worst end of it in any kind of a story. Well, I suppose I must be clearing out now, said the burglar, taking up his lantern and brace bit. You have to take the rest of this chicken and the bottle of wine with you for Bessie and her mother, said Tommy calmly. But confound it, explained the burglar, in an annoyed tone. They don't want it. I've got five cases of Chateau de Becheville at home that was bottled in 1853. That claret of yours is corked, and you couldn't get either of them to look at a chicken unless it was stewed in champagne. You know, after I get out of the story, I don't have so many limitations. I may make a turn now and then. Yes, but you must take them, said Tommy, loading his arms with the bundles. Bless you, young master, recited the burglar, obedient. Second story, Saul, will never forget you. And now hurry up and let me out, kid. Our two thousand words must be nearly up. Tommy led the way through the hall toward the front door. Suddenly the burglar stopped and called to him softly. Ain't there a cop out there in front somewhere sparking the girl? Yes, said Tommy, but what? I'm afraid he'll catch me, said the burglar. You mustn't forget that this is fiction. Great head, said Tommy, turning. Come out by the back door. End of Tommy's Burglar